Hello. Hello. I met Neil uh, in Washington. We, uh, uh, this was during the, uh, the Mueller days. And we sat and uh, talked. And I, I, you know, you've all seen Neil on television. And uh, I don't know if you're like me, but when he comes on, I'm like happy. I get, Wait, I get, is this because of the rules in California about legalized substances? or what No, you? it has nothing to do with that. I haven't smoked weed since the 60s, uh, which is true. No, I just, because I know when you're on, you're going to say something that's going to educate me, it's going to make me smarter, and also you make me feel good because I, I feel hopeful when I see you. So I want to, first before we get into, you know, the, the, before we open the hood and get into the weeds, Tell me, give me your overall feeling about today and where we are with uh, the impeachment. Okay, so first of all, I just want to thank everyone for putting this event together. And Rob, I have to thank you because, honestly, the idea that the Constitution would bring this crowd out, um, and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so thank you. Um, yeah. So I think we're in... Here's my copy. A, Constitution. I think we're in a pretty good spot relative to the dismal last three years. Um, and by that I mean, I think the last three years have been characterized by a president and a party who just doesn't give one whit about yeah. this document, the Constitution. They're in it for themselves and for um, their raw power. And, you know, I think our founders did have a check on that in the form of impeachment. And I think they actually had a check on it in the form of indicting a sitting president. Um, but, you know, the Attorney General took that away um, when he summarized or missummarized the, the Mueller report. But, you know, I think the genius of our system is that truth finds a way to come out. Our founders had separation of powers of three branches, so the House, which is controlled by a different party now, is investigating. They also had freedom of the press and the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And those things together kind of work in a synergistic way to start to ferret the truth out. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Obviously, we're, we're seeing each other uh, about 24 hours after the revelations that John Bolton, the president's national security advisor, has written a book that basically destroys the Trump defense. So, you know, just to put it in context, there are two articles of impeachment against the president. Article one is called abuse of power. And the basic argument is the president tried to cheat in the 2020 election with the help of a foreign government. What he tried to do, according to the allegation, is he withheld $391 million in aid that you and I pay for, taxpayer aid, to Ukraine, which is fighting this war against the Russians, until the Ukrainians announced an investigation into Burisma and the Bidens. And what the president has said is, oh, there's no firsthand evidence that that occurred, and I didn't do it. I was legitimately fighting corruption. So... Bolton's book says, uh, uh you withheld the aid. I was there because you wanted dirt on the Bidens. So it blows it apart. Um, now, and, because, because uh, the House managers and have been requesting witnesses for quite a while, and they've been stonewalled, and not only witnesses, but documents and all evidence, this revelation about Bolton saying that he was in the room when they, when, as he quotes, the drug deal was going down and he didn't want to be any part of it. What do you feel, because uh, we're champing at the bit to have a real trial with yeah. witnesses and documents, what are the chances now that Bolton has come out and we see this in public that he will get to testify? I think the chances are extremely high that we're going to see Bolton testify. And I think... And then I think we're into a real trial. And that's why I've always been optimistic that this impeachment proceeding will result in the removal of Donald Trump. Um, and, and the reason for that, is, you know, let me back up a little. I talked about Article 1 of the impeachment accusations. Article 2 is called uh, obstruction of the congressional investigation. And what Trump did, he did something no president ever in our history has done, which is to say... Not a single witness, not a single document will be turned over because this investigation is illegitimate in the House because it's controlled by Democrats. Of course, he also said at that time, when it's the Senate, I'd love to have the witnesses testify. He said, I'd love to have Mulvaney and Pompeo and others testify. Now that we're in the Senate, of course, he wants none of that. 
And I think, you know, it's easy to see what's going on here. He knows the truth. He knows what the witnesses are going to say. He knows what the documents are going to say. So he's trying to hide them. And I ultimately think that the American people are, are smart enough to realize what's going on there. And yes, I know that the president, you know, whether it, the head on a pike thing is true or not, I don't know. But, um, but uh, you know, he's certainly not exactly someone who doesn't threaten those who disagree with him, as he did with Representative Schiff just yesterday, saying, you know, some like bad things are going to happen to you. I don't remember what the, yeah. what the phrase is. Well, he also, I mean, uh, right at the outset of the trial, there were a number of motions, I mean, a number of uh, motions made by uh, uh, Chuck Schumer to have uh, certain witnesses, and they were voted down. Uh, the, the rules of the Senate, uh, the resolution that they adopted said that they could only address the idea of witnesses after both sides had made their presentations. Well, tomorrow probably they're going to finish up, the, uh, the uh, president's team is going to finish up its presentation, and then we'll be at that place where uh, hopefully we can discuss whether or not witnesses will be, can be called. And you wrote a piece today. How many people read Neil's piece in the New York Times today? Well, it's worth reading, but for those of you who didn't read it, uh, it was eye-opening for me because I was always concerned that, let's say, uh, Adam Schiff said, okay, we want to call John Bolton. What would be the procedure? What would be the process by which we could get John Bolton? My understanding initially was there had to be a vote by the full uh, Senate, and it only took a majority, a simple majority, that you'd need 51 senators to vote in favor of John Bolton. Now, a couple of days ago, you would have said they probably wouldn't vote for John Bolton. But now that we've seen what's come out, there's more of a likelihood that you might get 51 senators. But it would take four Republicans to go on the side of the Democrats so the Democrats could get 51. We have only 47. We'd need four to get 51. So the question was, you know, what if we can't get the four senators? And that was the subject of, of Neil's op-ed in the New York Times today. So maybe you could explain to them the procedure by which they could get John Bolton and then ultimately open the floodgates to quite a few more witnesses and then it becomes a real trial. Yeah, so I started writing this piece over the weekend before I knew that the Bolton thing would happen last night. And in fact, we closed the piece at about 4 p.m. with the New York Times and about 6.30. And you know that, that just shows how beautiful their separation is between editorial and news. Uh, the Bolton stuff comes out. And I wrote the piece initially because the conventional wisdom is you do need to have those four Republicans Turn, you know, switch their you know votes or whatever you want to call it, uh, and vote with the Democrats. And I looked at the rules, and that isn't true. Now I don't think this is going to matter in the end because I think now because of Bolton, I think you will get those four senators. But let me outline the two different paths by with by which we're going to see witnesses, or we could see witnesses. One is this idea: the Senate rules say that um, uh, that uh, the there, there is a, Rule 24 allows for the subpoena of witnesses, and it actually prescribes the form for if you want to do it. And it says House managers have to use the following language. And that has been there since 1868. Now, what Trump's lawyers have done is say, well, yes, you can. There, there is that subpoena rule, but you need to have the Republican Senate, or you need to have a majority of senators vote first for the subpoena which is just not true. There's a rule expressly in the document, in the 1868 rules, Rule 5, which says the Chief Justice <coughs> is empowered to enforce all orders and rules uh, uh, that are for the impeachment. And so uh, I know this gets a little technical, but the bottom line here well, is this that... Is, this is important because this is going to determine whether or not we have a real trial or not a real trial. I'm going to ask you another question after you say this. Yeah, so... so <laughs> <coughs> So, and he'll know. So, so what this means, in my judgment, is that the House managers can ask the Chief Justice for these witnesses, and the Chief Justice decides. And the Senate can't overrule the Chief Justice without a two-thirds vote, because they need to change those pre-existing rules, which requires a two-thirds vote of the Senate to do so. 
And that all that gets fairly complicated, but the bottom line is the way I'm reading it, and I think it is the right way, is that the Chief Justice gets to decide. Now, then that might ask okay, the Okay, so now the question is, now I'm gonna ask you to play a little chess here, because uh, we're feeling pretty good about the fact that we probably will have f at least four senators that would vote, uh, Republican senators that would vote for, for uh, witnesses, so, if we approach the Chief Justice and he says, well, if he says yes, then it's going to be very difficult for the senators to overrule that because that's the Chief Justice saying yes, he was, he was appointed by a, a Republican, and that would be very difficult. But on the off chance that the Chief Justice says no or punts it to the Senate, how do you feel? I mean, is, is it, I guess the question is, would it be better for Adam Schiff to, or to say, I want this witness and throw it to the Senate to vote or go to the Chief Justice first? All right, so first of all, <clears throat> I think in all the Trump lawyering today and all the different people who have attacked the New York Times op-ed, nobody attacks the idea that the House managers can go to the Chief Justice first and make a decision. The debate is only over whether 51 senators are enough to overrule him. So I think that's important because this is a chief justice, in my judgment, and we can talk more about this later, who I think does that, you know, he's different politically than I am and, and so on, but I've argued 41 cases in front of him. He's a fair man. And I think that, you know, he is a believer in institutions. He knows what a trial is. It turns out trials have witnesses. Um, <laughs> so, so I do think that that sequencing of, of Schiff and others asking the chief justice for Bolton and others is the right first move. Okay. Now then the question is, will the Republicans be able to overrule the chief? I think if the chief makes a straight ruling that these witnesses are in, I think it's incredibly hard. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a very solid <coughs> chief justice appointed by a Republican president, has you know, worked for Reagan. You know, it's going to be incredibly hard, I think, for that to happen. Now to take your other, your other question, though, suppose the chief says, I don't want to decide this. I'm going to kick this to the Senate to decide. That's where the debate is, whether the rules allow that. In my judgment, I don't think they do, but you know, I could see the argument on the other side. Even still, I think at that point, you haven't lost anything by asking the Chief Justice first. And I think, if anything, you've, shine, you know, you've shown a little light on really the momentous decision that the senators would have to make. It'll be their call and their call only, and the idea that we're going to have a trial without the president's national security advisor who's destroyed the Trump defense at the trial? I mean, the Soviets wouldn't even do that. So, I mean... <clears throat> hey, you're not supposed to get bigger laughs than me. <clears throat> no, I kid. Uh, let, let me ask you... <laughs> See? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, to get a little further in the weeds, let's say, for the sake of argument, Chief Justice says, yes, you can have John Bolton, and the president's uh, counsel, uh, per the instructions of the president, want to claim executive privilege. What would happen then? Okay. So first of all, I just want to make sure everyone understands, because we're, you know, Washington's far away. Who is John Bolton? John Bolton was the president's national security advisor. He's known as a hawk. He's been in several different conservative administrations. At one point, he had the number two position at the State Department and the ambassador to the United Nations, in which he had said, you know, if 30 floors of the UN disappear, we wouldn't be any worse off. Okay, this is not exactly, you know, like Rob and I's kind of dinner companion on a Tuesday night. Okay, so <laughs> as national security advisor, he is the president's, you know, if not the president's number one confidant, the number two to the chief of staff. It depends. I served in two administrations. The national security advisor was basically one step under God. I mean, that's how important they are. And Bolton's in the room, in the room where it happens, with all this stuff about Ukraine, and, set, and destroys the Trump defense. Now, the, I think the way this plays out is he, he's subpoenaed. The president has said, 
he wants to claim executive privilege. Now, executive privilege is this idea, it's not in the Constitution itself, but it can be traced back to George Washington, the idea that there are certain communications between the president and his advisors that would be dangerous if they got out into the public, uh, you know, and the foreign relations, things like that. And there's undoubtedly a zone of executive privilege, particularly when you're dealing with civil litigation. You're suing the president, and you know, you're the Iranian government, and you seek discovery. What has the president said to his national security advisor about Iran? Executive privilege, no problem. Impeachment? Ah, oh, nobody thinks that executive privilege applies to impeachment. Indeed, President Polk in 1846 said, you know, there's a strong zone of executive privilege for all sorts of stuff, but the moment we're in impeachment territory, that goes away because impeachment is the people's ultimate check. And you can't have a system in which the president can go and break the law on Monday and on Tuesday claim executive privilege to hide all the documents. Just structurally, that's what kings are made of. That's not what presidents are made of. And that's what, that's, he's, but that's what he's been trying to do. 100%. That's what he's doing. And he <clears throat> doesn't even have the guts, by the way, to use executive privilege. He just says he's going to announce executive privilege, but he won't do it. And you want to know why? Because if you invoke executive privilege, you have to turn those documents over to a court for them to review it. And he is scared <laughs> out of his mind yeah. that, of that. So, that, so, so the, the executive privilege will be out. So on the merits, I think executive <clears throat> privilege is out. But that's not, I think, the president's goal. The president doesn't, doesn't he, does, he knows he's going to lose this. The question he's thinking to his, with his lawyers is, can I tie this up until November in the courts so that if Bolton is called, I can block his testimony through the election, and then after the election, you know, it'll be a different story. So... The problem with that, though, is that we're in, sitting in an impeachment, and it doesn't require a court. Indeed, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court 15 years ago said, when you have an impeachment, the federal courts have no business in impeachment whatsoever. They said that unanimously. And so um, there isn't a way for, I think, the president to claim executive privilege to the courts. So now would, he, would Roberts then make that rule? Exactly. It would go to the chief <laughs> justice, the Chief Justice cares a lot about executive power. He's a zealous you know, advocate of it. I had the privilege of arguing, for example, the Muslim ban, Muslim ban case at the Supreme Court, and he broke my heart when I, he ruled five to four on the third trap Muslim ban that it was constitutional, and he did so on the basis of executive power, saying we can't restrict presidents uh, when they are afraid or they or their voters are afraid of um, uh, of uh, uh, you know of an immigration threat um, I think that decision was profoundly wrong but nonetheless and by the way it's a three-year anniversary today of the president's first travel ban which did you know did get into the ash ashes <coughs> of history as the court struck that down and you know and then they struck down the second travel ban but but the third one was upheld um, and so you could say is this chief justice, such a believer in executive pr power that he's going to rule for the president? I think actually the answer to that is no. This is such a ridiculous claim of executive power. Nobody believes it. I mean, mm. they, they, there's not a single academic that they can find besides Alan Dershowitz who teaches criminal law. Um, so, but well, we're, we're going to get to Alan Dershowitz in a second. Come on, uh, let's just we, we do, want it. To do it. You want to go Dersh? <laughs> Should we get to Dersh? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so right, right How many people uh, listened today to some of the proceedings? It was the president's case. They were, you know, had, I can't see hands, but a lot, a lot. Okay, good. Um, so essentially, you all know what the president is being charged with. He's being charged with trying to, and I was, I was hoping that they would have put bribery into the articles of impeachment because bribery is specifically mentioned in the Constitution, uh, bribery, treason, or, or, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. That other high crimes and misdemeanors is kind of amorphous, and we don't quite, you know, we have, nobody's ever been able to define it, but the president, obviously what we've seen he, he did, he, he shook down a foreign country, he, he bribed, tried to bribe a foreign country to gin up some dirt on his, at, at time, political opponent in order to help him win an election. Now, on the, on, the, on the surface of that, that's a violation of campaign finance. And I wish they put that in there, too, because they keep saying he didn't break any laws. Well, that's a campaign finance violation, and on top of which, he didn't release the money, and according to the GAO, 
that's against the law. The Congress has appropriated the money. The money has to be released. But the House, uh, the, uh, the, the, the president's lawyers, they didn't argue any. They can't argue any of the facts. The facts are there. They keep saying, listen to the call. It's a perfect call. Even one of his uh, uh, lawyers said, well, I wouldn't call it a perfect call. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, if you wanted to investigate the Bidens or Burisma, maybe you go through our Justice Department and you don't send Rudy Giuliani off on a wild goose chase. He, his lawyer said that. But there were a number of things that were talked about, and they can't argue the facts, so they've been reduced to arguing what the Constitution says. What is an impeachable offense? Is abuse of power an impeachable offense? Is obstruction of Congress an impeachable offense? And they got Alan Dershowitz to argue that, who year, years ago said the exact opposite. And now I've re he said, I've really studied this now, and I've taken my time, and, and I've come to a different conclusion. The conclusion he came to is that he wasn't on television enough, and he needed to get a little bit more exposure. That's just my thought. I don't know. But I want you to argue. I want, you to, I want to hear what you have to say about abuse of power and obstruction of Congress as impeachable offenses. Right. So the Dershowitz argument today was you can't impeach for those things. You can only impeach for things that are crimes. OK. So like, here's an example like, of something that is obviously impeachable. The president goes and nukes Canada because he is upset with Justin Trudeau dissing him in a, with some foreign leaders. That's not a crime, but it's, it's a new Canada. It's not a crime. There's no criminal statute against that. But it's obviously impeachable, and we wouldn't have to wait four years to get rid of the president. Or to take an example closer to home, suppose Russia invades New York City and Los Angeles, and the president does nothing about it. Um, that is, again, not criminal, but it is obviously impeachable. Indeed, bribery, you mentioned the phrase in the Constitution uh, is treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's what's impeachable. Bribery wasn't a crime in 1787. So there was, it was a common law offense. And so it's in the same way as abuse of power is, in the same way as obstruction is. So, um, you know, the, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how crazy the Trump arguments are. They can't get a single scholar to agree with them. They can't point to anything. And this is their- Even Jonathan Turley, I don't think, agreed with I that. I think that's right. Yeah. Even, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, they're way out there. And I think the hope that they have is, well, if they can just throw up enough stuff and make it look really complicated, then it'll be like the 22 months of the Mueller report and everyone's eyes will glaze over and, you know, and Trump will scare us about the next caravan or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, they also, uh, you know, they, they, it's interesting because you see Trump all the time, no collusion, no obstruction, it's a hoax, it's a witch hunt, it's a, you know, sham. And he actually had one of his lawyers, uh, Pam Bondi, who is an attorney general from Florida. You know Pam Bondi? She's the one that got a $25,000 donation from the Trump charity, took it out of his charity, gave it to her so that she wouldn't investigate Trump University. So that's who that is. And she's there working. And she basically did what Trump wanted Zelensky to do which was to get all this information out, supposed negative information out about the Bidens. And she laid out this thing. It's the most crazy crackpot uh, 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 look at Burisma and what uh, Hunter Biden did and what Joe Biden did. Has anybody been able to follow and understand what their supposed argument is about uh, Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. Does anybody have an idea of what that is? Because it's very confusing. Okay, so we're going to uh, walk you through. This is what she said. This is what she said, and this is what happened. They had a prosecutor there. His name was Lutsenko. Lutsenko was corrupt, and he was not investigating Burisma, which was supposedly corrupt, and the oligarch who ran Burisma. Hunter Biden now, this is the bad part, this is, and, but this is not against law, but major nepotism was going on here. 
he got a job at Burisma as a board member solely, and he even admitted it because he was Joe Biden's son. That's nepotism. It's not good, but it's not against the law. So this Lusenko guy, he's not investigating. So they say, we got to get rid of Lutsenko. They get rid of him, and they get a guy named Shokin in there. And Shokin is now the new guy who's going to investigate Burisma, the Bi you know, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden. Joe Biden is sent because Shokin is not investigating. He's pulling back, and he's not investigating anything. They now send Joe Biden over there. Are all of our European allies, the UN, the International Monetary Fund, all of them, and at the behest of the Obama administration, Biden is sent over there to get rid of this guy, Shokin, because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, which is investigating Burisma. Now, if, if I'm Joe Biden and my son is involved in some illegal stuff, the last thing I want to do is get a, a guy who's not doing the job and put a guy who's going to get my son. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy on the, on the surface of it, but that's what they're claiming. They're claiming that there's some kind of corruption. Now, if you looked and you followed this thing carefully, what you'll notice is that Trump didn't really want an investigation into the Bidens. He wanted Zelensky to make an announcement that there was an investigation into the Bidens so that he could run with that throughout the campaign, just like they did with Hillary's emails. Hopefully the press won't bite the way they did with Hillary's emails, because that was a, a total red herring. So, but that's where it is. And because this scheme that they try to pull off, which is withholding money in order to get that investigation, the announcement of the investigation, it didn't come off because a whistleblower blew the whistle and it was all exposed. Trump had to back off, he had to give the money, and it, it all went away. So now he can't investigate the body. He can't even look like he's doing it. But he has Pam Bondi go out there on television today and do what he was asking Zelensky to do. And all that is designed, in my opinion, all it's designed to do is to keep his base occupied and stoked to think something's bad here. Hunter Biden and Joe Biden, because at the time he thought Joe Biden was going to get the nomination. He may still get the nomination. He's right up there at the top. And if that's the case, he's worried about Joe Biden. And that's why he did it. Am I, am I misstating anything No, here? I think that's basically right. I think that if you want to understand what's going on, if, you, if you're confused, as you said you were, about what is the actual allegations about Hunter and Joe Biden and how, what is the Trump story, I think you have to go to that veritable legal source, InfoWars. And if you go to that, <laughs> yeah. you'll really Alex understand. Alex Jones, man, right. he's, got, I mean, he's got his hand, finger just, on the beat. It's just a bunch of stuff thrown up. And you know, it's not just the InfoWars and all the base kind of social media around this. It's re strikingly even Republican members of Congress. I remember that during the House side of this, you know, on the first day of the hearings, one of the Republican House members takes a page of my book and blows it up and said, you know, and it's the page of the book in which I say Hunter Biden did something wrong, which is, you know, he wasn't some energy expert, just in the same, you know, he's no energy expert, he did something wrong. And they blow that up to say, oh, you, you know, even, you know, Katyal agrees that, uh, that this is uh, not impeachable because it's legitimate investigation. Of course, before it, I say, you know, Hunter did something wrong, and it doesn't mean that the president is allowed to withhold aid and get dirt on him. And right afterwards, I said, you know, it's nothing compared to what Javanka's doing um, with respect <laughs> to nepotism. They didn't, of course, put any of those parts of the book on yeah. the screen. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that the bottom line here is that even if you credit everything that Trump has said about wanting a legit, you know, that he was worried about all this, the problem is that there are witnesses who have said, you just wanted the announcement of the investigation. The Lev Parnas thing, which you know, we haven't talked about yet, but that just came out last <coughs> week. I mean, Parnas has the tape and the information, and, and Parnas is saying in, in that Trump didn't actually care about Burisma. He just wanted to tar Biden with this investigation of the Ukrainians. Yeah, and so, then, so they, he had somebody out there doing his bidding, and that's what he had all these guys. They were all doing a piece of what Trump would like to do. I, I think if Trump, if we're up to Trump, he'd like to be his own uh, you know, lawyer. Of course, they always say if you, you know, 
you got an idiot for a lawyer if you, if you, if you defend yourself, you know. <laughs> anyway, but uh, he, he's had everybody, you know, putting out the, all those arguments that he's always had. There was something interesting that Alan Dershowitz said uh, towards the end, and it was echoed by, uh, 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 I think, Cip Cipollone. Yeah, Cipollone uh, echoed it. I mean, Dershowitz would talk about walking in somebody else's shoes. And simply owns talked about, uh, you know, doing to others. I mean, to think about, you know, how would you feel if somebody did this to you? In other words, if you don't look at it through a partisan lens, think about if the candidate and the president that you were supporting, you found out that they were trying to shake down a foreign country to uh, try to cheat in an election, would you feel the same way? And I go, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, is there even an argument? I mean, that's the thing that, that, that was the craziest argument. I mean, to, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm going to say this because I said this to Bill Clinton a million years ago. I'm sitting with him, and, and it, was, it was, if you remember, he got a haircut on the runway a long time ago, you know? And, I, and, he, and he was so upset because they were just attacking him and all this stuff. And I said, you have to understand, there's a big difference between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans know they're right. Democrats entertain the possibility that we might be wrong. <laughs> That's called fairness. So if it happened to our guy, we'd say, you're not allowed to do that. That's wrong. Or if, you know, like in the 2000 election, if our guy, you know, uh, you know, if the Supreme Court were the other way, we'd say, well, wait a minute, they should have a full count. They should let them uh, count all the votes in Florida. That's a fairness. And I would like to think that we think that way. Where Republicans know about power and they grab power. They know how to do it. They're really good at it. And we're fighting, you know, Marcus of Queensberry rules here. And it's sometimes we get, we get bloodied up. But I hope that we're in a, that we're checkmating them a little bit with this, Bolton. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, I mean, look, I would hate to be, uh, the, I would hate to see the Democratic Party go the way of the Republicans and stand for nothing um, except raw power. I think that would be a, a, a deep mistake. And here, you know, we are talking about something a little different than haircuts and so on. We're talking about the rural law. And there's a reason Lady Justice is blindfolded. It's because the whole idea is you're not supposed to make decisions based on with the identity of the parties before you. And so I, you know, that's probably the only time I'll ever say it, but I wholeheartedly will endorse the Trump defense lawyer's argument today that you should think about if the shoe's on the other foot. Absolutely. And indeed, that's the way I start the book. I call it the yardstick rule. And basically, you know, um, I came up with it because I did something that I think is probably going to be controversial in this room. You know, 10 days after the president was elected uh, and took office, I supported his Supreme Court nominee, Neil Gorsuch, and, um, uh, and wrote an uh, editorial in the New York Times and then testified for him. And everyone was like, why are you doing that? And I said, well, you know, I had the privilege of serving as Elena Kagan's deputy in the Solicitor General's office. And I was so mad when the Republicans voted against her. And I said, you know, like, how do you get someone more qualified than this? First female solicitor general in history, first dean of the Harvard Law School, just like an incredibly talented woman. And yet you had these Republicans vote against her. And I thought that was outrageous. And so when Gorsuch was nominated, I said, look, to myself, look, I don't, he's not who I'd nominate in a million years, but I do think that the president gets some deference in this area. Um, and so, and I said, you know, the yardstick is just a, you know, if the yardstick, same yardstick, doesn't matter who yeah. the nominee is. Yeah. And I feel that's so <coughs> true about this. I mean, I don't know how, you know, any one of the hundred senators on either side can do anything but get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and ask themselves that question. If Obama did it, which way would I be voting on witnesses yeah. and guilt and removal? Um, Democrats should ask that question. Republicans should ask that question. I think if they actually ask that question and look into their souls, I think the answer here is obvious. Yeah, yeah. Let, I wanted to, before we, you know, because we'd love to hear some of your questions too, but before we get into that, I want to talk about, there have been four, I mean, there's only been three uh, uh, presidents in history that have actually 
uh, gone to trial in the Senate uh, over impeachment. The fourth one was Nixon, and he resigned before that was going to happen. And he was made, it was made very clear to him by uh, Senator Goldwater and others that came to him and said, you're going to be impeached, and we don't have enough votes in the Senate to prevent you from being uh, convicted. So he resigned. But I'd like to just, if you know, for everybody to understand where the issues on this impeachment is compared to Andrew Johnson, and then uh, Nixon, then Clinton, and now and now Trump. Yeah. So I, I would say that the allegations against the president are the most serious that any president has faced. Now Andrew Johnson did a whole bunch of really horrible stuff. He, you know, after the Civil War, he basically ended Reconstruction. But the articles that he was impeached under didn't allege that. They alleged actually a violation of an obscure law called the Tenure of Office Act, which has to do with how, law, you know, firing a federal officials. And that law was later declared unconstitutional. So it was a technical offense. And even still, it went down and he was not removed by one vote in the United States Senate. Um, Nixon and Clinton were both um, uh, being inve Nixon investigated, Clinton charged with abuse of power, the very same offense that today Professor Dershowitz says is not impeachable. And Nixon uh, was also charged with abuse of power. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they was being investigated under <coughs> it at least. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but, but here's, I think, the fundamental difference. When you go back and look at the, and this is a big part of my book, when you go back and look at what happened in Philadelphia in 1787, here's the story about impeachment. It's a super hot summer. They spend the first two months hashing out the first three articles, the great you know, powers of the courts, Congress, and the presidency. And they ultimately decide we want a really strong president, as Alexander Hamilton says, a president imbued with secrecy and dispatch and the most awesome powers um, you know, that could be concentrated in one person. But some things would be checks and balances. Congress could make the laws, for example. The courts would check the president and the like, but still, very muscular president. And then we got to the last month of Philadelphia, and they said, well, how about if a president errs? What are we going to do? And many founders, like Elbridge Gerry, said, you know what? We shouldn't have an impeachment clause in the Constitution because we have re-elections. And there are every four years, and this is before the presidents were limited to two terms in office, the constitutional amendment on that. So Gary said, hey, don't worry about it. We can just have uh, elections check this. And do you want to know what Hamilton and Madison said to that? They said, well, wait a minute. What if you have a president who is working with a foreign power? What if you have a president who's manipulating the election? And even Gary changes his mind, Elbridge Gary, and says, absolutely, we do need to have an impeachment clause in the Constitution. So this is core impeachment. This is not like, you know, you can make arguments about Clinton one way or the other and so on, or, you know, and, and Johnson. Um, but this is really what the clause is about. And, you know, and so it's striking today to hear the president's lawyers say, oh, let's just wait until the election. That's like, you know, if, if Rob and I are playing a game of Monopoly and he accuses me of cheating, the answer can't be, oh, let's just play another game of Monopoly and see who wins. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Now, do, do the, how many people actually remember what Clinton was impeached over? What, 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 what do you think? Lying, lying to, well, he lied, he lied not to Congress. He lied in a deposition. Uh, that was a, it was a civil suit that was brought, uh, Paula Jones brought a civil suit three days before the statute of limitations ran out. And the deposition that he lied about was his relationship to Monica Lewinsky, which was deemed irrelevant in that civil suit because it was not sexual harassment. Now you could argue one way or the other, but the judge in that case threw that deposition out because that was not relevant to the case. So Clinton got impeached for lying about a deposition in the civil suit that was deemed irrelevant in a case that was eventually dismissed. Now, that's one thing. 
but he was being investigated for a bad land deal that he lost money on. And they said it was a corrupt land deal. They went for six, almost six years on this land deal that morphed into the Paula Jones things because Linda Tripp was talking to Monica Lewinsky and she tape recorded it and found out there was dirt and she was gonna get the dirt out. She was you know, a, a Republican person, at that operative kind of person. So when we're talking about the impeachment of a president, doing something against the public trust, abusing his office for his own personal gain, when you talk about Johnson, and even Nixon looks quaint compared to, and, and certainly Clinton, it's, what is okay, this? But there's, there's now we have, the, 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 we're in the hardcore main lane of why impeachment is there. Okay, I love you, but there's one extra part of this story that, okay. you, need to, that you need to know. Okay. Clinton is not just impeached for lying, to, uh, lying in the civil deposition. He's also impeached for abusing executive privilege. Right. And who put that charge together against him? A guy named Ken Starr. Star. The same guy who today said, oh, none of this is impeachable, when the invocation of executive privilege there was nothing compared to the wholesale blanket stonewall of Congress in this investigation. I mean, this is 100,000 times what that was in terms of the privilege invocation. And yet, you've got people like Starr going and saying, oh, nothing here, nothing. Yeah, they've all done 180s. If you look at Lindsey Graham, you look at Ken Starr, they're all doing huge 180s. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Let's, you know, do we have people with questions or do I read them? What happens here? Yes, I'll read them out to you. They can't You'll read them out. Okay. Great. okay. Jacob Weisberg, a uh, lady named Nancy Sensison, formerly of Slate, argues high crimes and misdemeanors refers to um, the high office of the presidency rather than the nature of the crimes. Is that something you can agree with, Neil? Well, I don't know enough about that argument. I don't know the Jake Weisberg piece, but I, I spent a long time in the book details it, the historical research around why high is in there. So you might think high crimes and misdemeanors mean serious crimes, but actually it doesn't. It's about offenses against the state. High is in terms of like royal uh, royalty. And so the idea is for an impeachable offense, it's got to be some crime against the public trust. As a member of Congress in 2008 put it, this business of high crimes and misdemeanors boils down to a simple question. Has the president put his, his, put, uh, put, put his interests over those of the American people? That's almost the direct quote. That congressman in 2008 was a guy named Mike Pence. Um, and that's, by the way, the way I, that's, I start the book with that quote um, for, for that reason. That has been the historical understanding and it doesn't require crime, and sometimes even the most serious crimes aren't impeachable offenses. So take, because we all love Hamilton, what happened to him? He is uh, in, in the sitting vice president, Aaron Burr, shoots and kills him. There's no call for Burr to be impeached at all. There's some calls for him to be investigated criminally and indicted and so on, but there isn't a call for impeachment because it's not a crime against the state. It's just, a, it's an ordinary simple crime. This, by It's the Fifth Avenue defense. Exactly. Yeah. So this, by contrast, is truly a crime against the public's trust. I mean, you know, we appropriate this money, not because we just like doling out money, but this is a small, this is a weak country against big, bad Russia. We appropriate this money because they need it. Trump knew they needed it. He knew it so much, so the Lev Parnas tape that was released which I've never under, you know, I've worked for two different presidents. The idea that someone could just go and record the president having dinner, like, is beyond me. Um, but, in, you know, leaving that aside, one of the things that happened is the president said, how long can they last? How long can Ukraine last without this military aid? And the answer was, like, no time at all. And then the president went and did this. And you, and you all know the importance of Ukraine. I mean, because, uh, you know, Secretary of Pompeo would have, Pompeo would have you believe Nobody cares about Ukraine. But if you do understand what Ukraine means to the United States in terms of a bulwark against Soviet, uh, Soviet the reconstitution of the Soviet Union, but Russian aggression and our allies in Europe, then you'll understand why this is important to us. Because 
he, Putin didn't like the fact that Ukraine wanted to have its own, have its freedom and wanted to be, uh, uh, you know, sovereign amongst, the, you know, in and un, of itself. And what very few people understand is that Ukraine, when it broke away from the Soviet Union, had tons of nuclear weapons. And we went in there and said, if you agree to, and we'll help you, to make sure that, you know, you, you can be free of Russia and you can start building your democracy, you get rid of your nuclear weapons, and they did. They did. So we owe, we, we owe it to Ukraine to stay healthy. Then, at that one point, they, we were talking about them joining the European Union and joining NATO. And Putin didn't like that, and so he invaded. And he invaded Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, and then separatist troops went in there and are now occupying part of Ukraine. So that's what's going on there. It's not just, you know, as, she, as uh, Pompeo said to the reporter from NPR, you, I bet you can't even find Ukraine on a map, and showed her a blank map with no names. And she said, yeah, well, you're an idiot. It's right there, you know? <laughs> but, but the point is, it's very important to us. It's, and, and I don't think uh, Trump has any understanding of the history of the 75 years that we've, uh, since the Second World War, and what that's meant to us in terms of keeping Europe, uh, you know, democratic and, and, and our allies. And now we've alienated them. So that's an important thing to understand. Neil, well, would you comment on recent decisions and statements and opinions Attorney General Barr has made? Uh, has some of that surprised you? Yeah, I mean, I love the Justice Department. Um, and the thing I love about it is that you go in and you really do try and say what's in the best interest of the United States long term. So, for example, I came in on January 20th, 2009, and reviewed every Bush administration position that the Justice Department had taken. We only changed position in one case that was existing because they actually had done a good job in thinking through what's the right thing for the United States government to stand for. And um, the Trump administration has flipped the Obama position, the Justice Department's longstanding position, at least 43 times. Mm -hmm. um, we did it in once. Um, and, you know, in a very important, the Defense of Marriage Act, you know, which there was very strong stakes um, in the president himself made that decision. Um, but the idea to do it willy-nilly like this, um, to have this attorney general so blatantly mischaracterize Robert Mueller's work, I have, you know, it's, it's hard to look at that and to think that this attorney general will go down in any decent way in history. What do you think he's doing? What do you think, what is he about? I don't, I, that I don't, you know, because he had been respected. I mean, he had been an attorney general in a previous administration. Yeah, I can't speculate. I mean, I've, I've seen this now, you know, in, I love my city, but I've seen this now with uh, a lot of these older men, and, um, you know, they, they had good careers, they, they hewed to, you know, mainstream positions, and then all of a sudden they become wackadoodle. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> That's it, wackadoodle. <laughs> What's so let us hope it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll move to L.A. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, he other, never said whack a doodle until he came to LA. If yeah. other Republicans uh, like Pence are lying about their involvement in the holding of the re Ukrainian funds, is there any congressional recourse to hold them accountable? Well, sure. If, if, if you know, and again, I have no idea to, whether Pence is misrepresenting things or not, but to the extent he is, you know, lying to the Congress is itself a crime, um, and it's certainly, you know, an impeachable offense. Um, and so, you know, anyone who did lie, you know, could face those, but those twin sets of powers. Um, you know, so, but you know, it, my gut is, Pence is really good at being invisible um, and a potted plant. And um, <laughs> so, you know, I think it'll be probably hard to make out some sort of case like that. If, if you were uh, one of the House managers, and assuming you could get uh, Bolton, uh, and you had your, and that opened the floodgates to other witnesses. Who would, of the, all of the people that are out there, the, all the players, who, who would you pick to want to wanna, uh, interview? One name and one name only, Donald Trump. Um, and I think, uh, I, I actually, 
you know, I have so much respect for the way the House managers have conducted themselves. And Adam Schiff in particular, like, I think I run the, the best legal team in the country. I, I have the practice that John Roberts ran before. I, you know, I, I've taken it over. I have, I mean, there are 15 of the very smartest lawyers all clerked on the Supreme Court or the equivalent. And Adam Schiff could be part of my team, which, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, he was so, brilliant, absolutely yeah. brilliant. I mean, uh, really great. At the same time, I haven't understood why there isn't more pressure on Trump to testify. Trump says it's perfect and beautiful, and his entire defense is his state of mind, that I thought I was part pursuing corruption, not anything else. Well, if you believe that, go say that. And it's not like it's in front of the House, which is controlled by the opposite party. This is his own party, which controls a chamber, and you need a two-thirds vote to convict. And he's still scared to come before that body. Yeah, I think Clint that tells you all you need to know about the quality of his defense. And Clinton did testify. Even Clinton testified. So, you know, so that to me is, is where I would start. I do think, you know, Bolton and Pompeo and Mulvaney and then the guy who runs the Office of Management and Budget, um, Duffy. Duffy, yeah. uh, I think those are the next four. But, but to me, Trump's the big kahuna in this. And, yeah. You know. The big kahuna is another Los Angeles, you know, the <laughs> surfing. We surf out here. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, has any other administration in recent times had as many leaks as this administration? And, and do you think that that perhaps means there's people who care on the inside and are hoping some of this gets out? I do think that that, that is uh, the case. There's a Harvard law professor named Jack Goldsmith who basically uh, in, wrote a book called The Terror Presidency about 10 years ago. He served in a very high-ranking Justice Department position, and he said, you know, one of the big checks on abuse of government power is actually leaks. And leaks are a way to, when the government's doing something really bad, to have that information come out. Now, from my perspective, I think leaks are actually a really bad way because, uh, you know, particularly when you're talking about classified information, that world who gets classified information is already so homogenous. It's mostly, uh, you know, it's, it's guys, and they're all of a certain age, they're all of a certain educational background and the like. And I, I actually got to sit on the Covert Action Committee for a while and be part of this world. And you know, it was striking the degree of uniformity um, in the monolithism in, in the group. And um, uh, I think that uh, whenever you have a leak, like Snowden or something like that, one of the things that happens is that there's a tendency to compartmentalize that information even more and to keep it away from anyone who might look different or who might be a leaker. And so that it's a terrible way to, to run government, but there's a more terrible way to run government, which is the way the Trump administration's running it. And so because of that, I think we are seeing uh, more leaks. What else we got? Um, if Donald Trump is acquitted, can the House bring up and presumably more comes out, can the House bring up additional, in, 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 in additional impeachment charges? Absolutely, and in fact, I think that is exactly what will happen. We will have rolling impeachment. And, um, and <laughs> if the president doesn't like it, he can solve this right away by having the witnesses come out and for him to testify. But if he doesn't, if he's too scared to come out, in the Senate, then he'll have to come out in the House, and so will Bolton, and so will Mulvaney, and everyone else. And that's yeah, assuming that's, that's assuming he gets reelected because the uh, you know the, the, the subpoenas that are working their way through the courts are. T I mean, they ha still haven't gotten M McGahn yet. Right. So that is pending in our nation's second highest court, and you're absolutely right, Rob. It may take um, some time. Uh, and if he's not, re if he if he loses the election, if he runs and loses, um, you know, then there may not be as much of a desire to impeach him, because well, then he's going to be going. You know, then people are going to see criminal sanctions against him, and so that'll be probably where the focus is. You know, just as a theoretical matter, you can impeach someone who's left office because you are trying to bar them from future office. Is, is that? Oh, I didn't know so, that. Yeah, that. That's so, true. Yeah. Wow. So, um, wow. And, you know, there may be a really good argument, kind of truth and reconciliation, kind of let's do that and find, figure out what actually happened and the American people deserve answers. I think they, they might want to figure out what happens, particularly with regards to the emoluments clause and with regards to his taxes and all that for understanding future legislation that you might need to pass. 
But I do think that, uh, you know, the Southern District of New York and New York State is going to trump any effort to right. no, I mean, uh, uh, re-impeach. If Trump paid his legal bills, the law firms would be salivating right now because there are going to be a lot of legal bills yeah. after he leaves the yeah. office. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, would, that always should have been a tell for me. I mean, there's a million tells when you look at the past on Trump, just even before he became president. But in the 10 years prior to his running for president, he was involved in, I think it was close to 4,000 lawsuits. It was something 3,500 to 4,000. I mean, what is that? I mean, you know, that means you sue everybody over everything. No, I'm not paying that check. No, I didn't order the Coke. Um, you sue me. I mean, well, you sue for everything. You know, it's crazy. No, I feel like I've filed 3,500 suits against him myself. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Neil, what do you think Republican senators are afraid of? The wrath of the tweets or what? You know, what I think it is is the collective action problem um, is that they're worried. I think if they could all take a vote in secret that, you know, in, that would never get out, there's not a chance that this guy would survive that vote. He's just a fundamental threat to everything this country is about. And I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. All those senators came to Washington to make a difference on behalf of the American people. And there's no way that you could really look, you know, if you, if you could cast that vote in private, there's no way I think that you could cast it any other way. So the worry they have is this. How do we get to that, you know, 20, uh, 20, 20 senators or so that are going to need, Republican senators are going to need to vote against the president? When anyone who becomes a leader in that, the president immediately cuts down. So if you stick your neck out in any way, he's going to find out about it and then tweet against you and campaign against you and so on. So that's the problem is they need to figure out a way to actually have that conversation. And it's very hard when there isn't um, a guarantee of success. Yeah, well, I do think, though, by the way, sorry, just yeah, go ahead, go ahead. on the witnesses, I think if Bolton comes forward, that dynamic starts to change. And we're already seeing it today yeah. when the Republicans in the Senate are really mad at the White House for being blindsided by the Bolton book. And then when I think when Bolton testifies, and then presumably we'll have Mulvaney and others, I think then all bets are off and the collective action difficulties could be overcome. Yeah, I think under, under other kinds of circumstances, it would be a lot easier, but Trump has remade the party. It's his party, so, and, and that is the base. And so people uh, who are in red states, they're worried they're either going to get primaried or uh, they're going to lose their elections because uh, he is now controlling the party. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, my, my dream would be that a majority of the senators vote to convict. I'm not saying 67, but a majority, because that's where the country is right now. Right now, the country is over 50% of the country wants to see him removed from office. And we only have 47 senators, but over 50% of the country. And interestingly enough, by a 20-point margin, I just saw a poll today, 20-point margin, independents want him to be removed by 20 points uh, over the ones who don't. So the country definitely wants to see him removed, but he has a grip on this you know, cultish you know, party that he has. All right, our final question for the evening. A gentleman says, I'm guessing most of us in this room tonight generally are in agreement and stand on the same side in this issue. How do we make an overture and a crossover and try to convince people who don't see it the way we do? Yeah, it's a great question. I spend most of my time thinking about that question. Um, and, you know, it, it went, during Mueller, I kind of thought if I was on TV a lot with Rob and others, that that would change people's minds. And, I realized I don't think it really does. Um, I know. thought it would too. We had, yeah. we did a bunch of videos with Robert De Niro, and you know, and it, nothing seemed to to move the needle at all. Yeah, but I do think this one has the possibility <coughs> of being different because it's actually the president's own guys who are accusing him. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, it, it, even Mick Mulvaney said, yeah, there was a quid pro quo, get over it. You've got Bolton, you've got others. And so this has a different valence for that reason, and also because 
the Mueller investigation, the allegations were about the president's behavior largely as a private citizen in 2016, so ostensibly colluding with the Russians. And um, you know, here the allegations is the president as president using the awesome powers the Philadelphia Convention gave him in 1787 and using those powers to benefit his private agenda, not that of the American people. It's fundamentally a different thing. And so I think it's all incumbent on all of us to talk about it at the dinner tables and everywhere um, because this is, this is not like not serious stuff. This is really the essence of what our democracy is about. If you can't trust the re-election camp, the re-election. If you can give uh, give to the president the power, the awesome power to cheat and to help with with the help of a foreign government to vote, then you are undoing the fundamental check and balance that we have as citizens, which is to vote someone out of office that we disagree with. And so I do think the stakes here are as high as they get. And so I hope all of you go and explain that. Yeah, I think they've got. Basically, we've got two existential threats right now. One is democracy and whether or not it'll survive. If he gets another four years, he's already gutted the Justice Department, he's gutted the State Department. Uh, we see uh, autocracy uh, uh, growing around the world, uh, even through Europe. That's, uh, the, so democracy is the one existential threat, is the threat. And then the other is, is climate change and whether or not the planet can sustain. And they're kind of inextricably linked because if we don't get this guy out, that's another four years where we only have, they say, 10 to 12 years to start really turning things around. And we've seen what this guy's done to environmental things. So, you know, call senators, uh, just keep, we got to just keep plugging away. There's a lot, a lot at stake here. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all Thank for coming. You.